Okay. I think we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our weekly Tuesday afternoon live stream. This week, I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and with me is Angie Atkinson. Angie, welcome. Thank you. Always happy to be here. It's always great to have you. And so I guess to get going this week, um, I had a great question that was sent to me and I figured we could just open with that and then we'll hop into the chat. So if, for those of you that are joining us, uh, if you have any questions for me and Angie, just feel free to type them in the chat and uh, yeah, there we go. So, okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, where's the question? Here it is. Okay. It says, what would you recommend most for healing and getting past it all? Not necessarily learning what they did, more of how to stop feeling all the negativity. How do I learn to relax again? How do I stop waiting or expecting them to show up or text? How do I stop wanting them to see my success without them? How to stop secretly hoping they'll return and be better? How to enjoy the things that they ruined for us, etc. Hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a big question, and it's it's an important question. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, it, it all has to, let me just start here and say this. I think one of the biggest things that I messed up on, oh, there it goes. Ha, the video started talking in my ear. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think, there we go. I think uh, one of the biggest things that I had trouble with was I tried to be happy <laughs> without resolving my issues. Um, and so like I didn't, I just was like, okay, well, it's over now. It's better. I'm fine over but I didn't work through all the emotions that went with it so I think I and I see that with a lot of people who think in a similar way that I do like I don't want to dwell on it any longer than I have to but unfortunately if we don't allow those emotions to come out first and kind of process them I think we end up stuck in a way mm -hmm. um, so I think I always recommend that people take the time to allow the emotions to flow before they try to let go of them um, for one thing. Um, I mean, this is such a, such a complicated question. I don't want to sit here. I, I could sit here and talk this whole hour about it. Um, but I think you have to start with healing yourself. And I'm going to make this quick because I, I know you have a lot of really good things to say as well. But um, I think start with letting the emotions happen. I think journaling is really helpful and effective. But I think ultimately, once you've worked through the emotions and you've started to work on your new normal and creating that in the in the way that you want it to look, you know, then I think you have to really turn inward and start to see who you are, who you wanted to be, who you should have been, that kind of thing, who you were before and how you can sort of translate who you want to be into the person that you currently are. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sort of make that shift. Um, it it's not something it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, but ultimately, I think for me, it was about number one, letting go of all of the old things that the narcissist put in my own head about um, who I was, who they thought I should be, who I wasn't, <laughs> and then um, working on understanding my own self worth and self-value, uh, not just self, but my value to the world around me, you know, mm -hmm. um, and developing what I would say is actual, actual self-esteem or self-confidence, not just um, sort of the mask that maybe I wore before that just sort of hid my real self, not uh, in a way because I was told who I was by various people in my life and I wasn't that, <laughs> but I, I tried to be who I was told I was supposed to be and I failed. And so I think um, I thought that I was wrong or bad. Anyway, I think we all have to find who we are and embrace that person, embrace that part of ourself. And then we have to go from there. Um, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you bring up a really interesting and valid point about the just feeling the feelings and how so many of us, after something traumatic happens, we feel like, okay, well, it's over. So Therefore, I just need to move on, right? And I think that really speaks to how there's um, how society in general views uncomfortable emotions and in view, in views trauma because none of us are really taught how to handle crisis or trauma, 
And so I think kind of the default is, well, I guess I should just get on with it. Right. Um, because we, we don't know, like, what's the other alternative? It, it, the other alternative feels like, well, I guess I'm just going to sit here in my misery and, and be stuck. So I don't want that. So I guess I'll just get over. But, but like you're saying, the middle ground there is, or actually the, the true way out is to allow ourselves to feel how we feel. And, um, and that's how we process through these emotions. It's not by avoiding them or denying them or suppressing them. So I think a lot of people get stuck in, in not knowing how to handle uh, the anger and the hurt and the fear and all of the different emotions that go along with it. Um, and as far as, let's see, stopping... Well, okay. So the, she, she mentions a couple of different things. Like, how do you relax again? How do you stop waiting or expecting them to show up or text? Yeah. And I think um, for, this has to be an active process, right? You can't just, so I, I want to pause really quickly. I, I started mm -hmm. to say something, but I was accidentally muted <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> really quick about what you were saying before. Okay. Um, one of the things I think that's happening today is that you know, books like The Secret and other law of attraction type books came out. And I found those and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the way, this is the way. And I do agree that the law of attraction is effective. However, I think a lot of those books and that those, a lot of teachers of this topic, they, they come out and they go, you know what, you, you don't have to feel how you don't want to feel. And, and you can, you know, really choose whether to feel happy or sad or angry or whatever. And I believe that up to a point, but I also know that when you have been through trauma, you don't always, you can't just let it go and, and pretend it didn't happen. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it, you can, but it will come back and bite you in the butt or the brain either way, <laughs> eventually. And so I think it's really important for people, even those who do subscribe to that, which again, I, I'm totally pro law of attraction, but I'm also pro processing emotion. So I just want to throw that out, uh, out there. Um, but as, as for, um, the other two questions, what were they, um, how do you stop? Uh, how do you learn to relax again? And how do you stop kind of, well, I guess let's start with that one. How do you learn to relax again? Okay. So I think for me, it was, it was a process, um, because you are so, um, I was, and I, I, th I think a lot of people can relate to this. So very like caught up in, keeping the narcissist calm or playing, you know, doing whatever they needed you to do so they didn't go crazy on you every day, you know, sort of managing their emotions that you stop um, even knowing how to relax or how to talk about yourself or anything. Uh, so, so I think you could start with things like meditation or, and, and let me just say this with meditation. For me, I'm not a sit down and hold my fingers like this meditation person. Like I have to move. And so I will put like my headphones on and I'll just walk or, or I'll, you know, whatever it is for you, it's about turning your brain off is what, in my opinion, what meditation is. It's about stopping the constant flow of, you know, thoughts, <laughs> you know, the inner dialogue, mm -hmm. like stopping it for a while so that you can kind of regroup. So I think that anything that helps you do that is a good place to start, whether that is watching old sitcoms or putting in your headphones and walking or sitting down with a candle and some incense and officially meditating or, you know, whatever it is for you. Some people like to run or, you know, swim or ski, or some people want to paint, you know, whatever kind of gets your head out of that place where you're, the flow is going all the time, the inter internal dialogue and start thinking about something else or thinking about nothing at all. It's a good place to start with relaxing. Um, and then to have rituals for yourself, like bedtime rituals where you, you know, like every night before I go to bed, I go and I sit in this, I have this little bedroom chair next to a little lamp, you know, and I sit there and I'll read or, or I'll journal or something, you know, I spend a few minutes just being quiet before I actually get into bed, you know, and I only go in my bedroom for that time and then morning time. And then I sit there in the morning again, and I usually watch Philip DeFranco, <laughs> but <laughs> whatever, but, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and, and hang out for a few minutes before I go back out into the world, you know, the rest of the house <laughs> um, or whatever. Uh, so I think, I think routines help and, and uh, rituals for yourself, as well as learning how to turn your brain off and then finding things you just enjoy doing that, that aren't 
necessarily productive or you know like if you really love you know some tv show make time to do that thing or if you really love knitting or you know dog care (laughs) (laughs) i don't even know (laughs) whatever people like you know just find something you love to do and do that anyway Uh, what are your thoughts on that um i like that dog care Uh, (laughs) dog care i don't know uh there's well i guess to start um it depends on what uh you know the relaxing uh, kind of why that anxiety is heightened so like for example let me give you a personal example when i was in high school i dated this guy who was scary scary psychopathic Mm -hmm. and he stalked me for years and it wasn't like on a regular basis it wasn't um how people normally think of stalking. And anyways, I lived with the state in the state of heightened anxiety for like four years. And I remember during the time thinking, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just relax? Right? This relationship's over. But the reality is it wasn't really over because he was still surfacing every now and again, even if it was, even if I'd go months um, without hearing from him and then he'd surface. So I guess what I'm saying is if that, if that threat, if this thing, this, this relationship with this person is still somewhat resurfacing, you know, if they text you periodically or, or if it's your ex and you have kids and you have to see them, uh, that's going to, or they're, they won't leave you alone. Like these kinds of things, that threat's still active. So it's understandable that, uh, that part of your brain is still activated and that's going to take a, a while to calm down and it's going to depend too if you are in legitimate danger um like in my situation with this guy that i dated i was in legitimate danger and so i would have been gaslighting myself and i was gaslighting myself for a long time as were other people telling me oh the relationship's over he's nothing to worry about oh he's just all talk and it's easy for us to to doubt ourselves or to think, oh, well, maybe I'm making a big deal out of nothing. Um, But the reality is we, we don't know if we're making a big deal out of nothing until something happens. But if that something happens means us getting attacked, then that's not a good way to figure out if we're in danger or not, you know? Um, So I guess what I'm saying is if you've done everything you can do to ensure your safety, uh, having some sort of uh, mace or personal protection, um, changing your locks, Mm -hmm. uh, moving if you can, um, uh, installing cameras if you need to, um, getting a dog, uh, you know, doing these kinds of things in order to ensure your safety, that will help you to relax because it's, it's helping you to be more safe. Um, And then everything else that you were saying, Angie, too, with I, and I really liked what you said about having a routine. I have found for the vast majority of people, myself included, it's it's that sense of regaining control over yeah. our lives of, okay, this, I need predictability and order mm-hmm. and structure in my life. And that, and just doing that, and it doesn't even have to be to like this insane, like impressive degree. It, just a little bit of routine really helps to ground a person. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And you know, something um, that I, I just saw this comment from Andrea in the chat. She said, learning how to refuse emotional flashbacks and redirect your attention and thoughts made a big difference for me too. And I actually, I teach this to my clients a lot of times, um, pattern interrupts. I've talked Mm -hmm. about it on YouTube bunches of times. And, and so in those, because here's the thing, I think a couple things, number one, um, in the moments that you feel that sense of I don't, I want to say, you know, deep emotional pain, that sense of almost desperation to feel better, to feel, or to, you know, maybe you're not even thinking about feeling better, but you just feel so horrible. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, In those moments, I find, you know, yeah, if you can just let the emotion out, great and move on, great. But sometimes it's too hard in those moments and, and you need to stop feeling that way. So, because you feel almost like you might expire. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think when she she said redirect your attention and thoughts to me that I thought pattern interrupts right away and that's 
you know, taking the time to switch it up a little bit, like to kind of get out of your own head. So maybe um, like Bonnie mentioned, watering the garden. Yeah, going outside and doing something um, different or standing up from the position you're in and shaking out a little bit or go brush your teeth or your hair, go take a shower, splash cold water on your face. Anything you can do to sort of distract yourself. It's like when you're telling a story mm -hmm. and you've told the story a million times and then someone interrupts you and then you can't remember where you are in the story that's a pattern mm -hmm. interrupt so you because you've told that story a thousand times so each time you tell the story you always tell the story the same way but then you know joe blow walks in and says something completely random and you're like wait where was i when you try to go back to the story well it's the same kind of concept with you know because what we're doing when we're you know going through these painful loops of emotions is a lot of times we are we're in a pattern like you mentioned you're kind of gaslighting yourself well that's a pattern that you learned along the way and so if you can start to break the pattern by changing something and then instead of focusing on what you don't want in that moment focus on something you do want whether it's something you're grateful for or your goal instead of the thing you're worried about focus on that instead and then move forward or something else, a completely unrelated like boy those flowers outside are super pretty maybe i'll plant some more flowers you know <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. um just the idea of being able to to distract excuse me to distract yourself sometimes uh and then move, able to sort of get out of that emotional like chokehold that you're in can allow you to then you know calm down and then go back and work through it when you feel more capable but again i'm very pro people might think i'm weird when i say what i'm about to say but crying we know there are physical pain relief benefits from crying and we, we know this like through various studies and if you've ever had a migraine <laughs> i have sometimes mm -hmm. crying is the only thing to take away some of that or to reduce you know reduce the pain a little bit but but the um the fact is that it also releases emotional pain and so sometimes you just need a good cry and sometimes I find that survivors can't cry right away or or they can't stop but if you're in one of those people who can't or you can't cry when it's when you have time to cry I find that um movies or mm -hmm. songs something like that you know I'll tell my clients you know get all the movies together that you know make you cry and get ready we're gonna have a weekend you know yep. and then you'll go through the whole week and then they feel better and sometimes you just need to to let it out and and I think I want to say it, you know if you're if you're more than three months out and you're still feeling um that deep pain you need to cry for a minute <laughs> you might you know what I mean even mm -hmm. though I'm not saying it solves anything but it re releases it from your body do you know what I mean yeah 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 absolutely I think um that's one of the the strategies that I encourage people to do as well is to kind of provoke that emotion to just kind mm -hmm. of milk that emotion yeah. so I'll, because you're saying a lot of people struggle with they they're like I'm so numb I can't cry I just yes. don't feel anything or if I do feel something it's just anger mm -hmm. and taking time to to watch and you know a movie like Beaches an old mm -hmm. movie or Titanic maybe not Titanic because it's a love story but um Some old yeller them. right yeah some type of sad sad movie that's not a love story um gets the tears flowing and it helps to bring that emotion forwards so you can uh start working through it yeah um how about this part the the uh how to stop waiting or expecting them to show up or text oh i love this question mm -hmm. um so one thing that i think is so so important for us as we're getting out of any sort of toxic relationship, whether or not we're talking about a romantic partner, even your parents, if you're going to contact with parents or friends or whatever, it's about these people have become part of your daily life or part of your regular life. So maybe you don't see your parent every day, but maybe you text them every day or they call you three times a week or whatever. So, wow. So what you have to do, I, I just looked over the screensaver on my oh. monitor thing and it's Anyway, uh, an old picture, ironically enough, of mm. something from my childhood. <laughs> anyway, um, you have to be able to. Um, I'm sorry, I just got distracted. Read me the question again. That's that okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's um, how to stop waiting or expecting oh. them to show up or text. 
right okay so so we have traditions with these people we have things you know and if we live with them it's even worse sometimes but you know we get up we have breakfast with them or we see them as we're having whatever you know um so i think one of the most important things in this way is to develop a new normal <laughs> and to think about and do it intentionally if you can you know so for example if um in the past you know, you would get up in the morning and you would make this person breakfast and then you would, you know, I don't know, lay their clothes out or whatever you did, you know, or maybe you just sit, stood there and talked to them while they did that or whatever, you know, narcissists have a way of taking up so much of our time and our energy that a lot of times when we get away from them, we just are like flailing, right? We're like, what am I even supposed to do with myself now that I have all this free time <laughs> or yeah. now that I'm not, you know, serving that person or whatever. And so I think it's super important to, again, I'm going to say routines here. I'm going to say, you know, new routines, new normal. So for example, let's, let me just use a holiday, for example, right? So at Christmas, maybe you and the narcissist would always X, Y, Z, whatever tradition you had. Well, maybe now that you're not with that person, you make a new tradition. So maybe if you always like had Christmas dinner, maybe now you have Christmas lunch and maybe you have it, you know, all hors d'oeuvres instead of the big turkey dinner or whatever, you know, you, you decide how you want things to be and you create new normal, new routines, new ideas, new, as different as you can be. And then one other thing um, that I think is really helpful is again, in the moment, the pattern interrupt thing. Yes. Uh, so let me just repeat the pattern interrupt for the painful parts of the, you know, if you need to stop yourself from focusing, sorry, on waiting or whatever. But the other thing is um, the, wait a minute, I almost had it. I was talking about routines and then the pattern interrupt. <laughs> I'll think of it. I'm sorry. I lost it. It was something really good too. Okay, go on. That's, um, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, my two senses on the stop waiting or expecting them to show up or text I think it depends on kind of the root of the emotion, like where this is coming from. If it's more of um, an anxiety thing, mm -hmm. if, if there's fear involved of, oh my gosh, I, um, the anxiety of, are they going to text? Are they going to show up? Or if it's coming from a place of, like Andrew was saying, that building or developing a new normal of now I'm not in a relationship and it's coming up with a different routine. Whereas before I was used to hearing from them several times a day and seeing them at night and now that's not there. Right. So it's kind of, it depends on what's driving that feeling. If it's the latter, if it's the, the feeling of, oh my gosh, I have to kind of get used to being single now, then um, I think that's tied into more of like a grieving process. Mm. And in a like, you know, as you're saying, like allowing yourself to cry and realizing it's going to take a little bit to develop a new normal, but that is where that routine can help. Yeah. So, so changing things up, I'm a very visual person, so it helps me. And I think probably a lot of people too, to, to really signify, to get clear that you're in this new chapter of your life. So rearranging your furniture, if you can paint uh, the walls, paint the walls a different color, um, cut your hair, color your hair, uh, get a, get some new piece of clothing or a new color of lipstick or, or whatnot. These kinds of things can help to signal to your brain that this is the next chapter. And, and once it, and then if you start kind of changing up your routine, even if it's just a little bit, let's say you normally have, I don't know, bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning. And that's what you had together for the next week or so have I don't French toast mm. so something different it, it it just it just changes things up enough to where because when we when there's all of this like residual these residual reminders of the our old life mm. we're constantly kind of being triggered you know it's it's triggering it's a it's a kind of an activator for, for all of these memories, whether we want them or not. And so, you know, putting away significant objects to that from, from that person or from that relationship, um, you're like, oh gosh, this painting over our couch is something that his or her mom gave us. And it really reminds me of them, put it in the closet or in the yeah. basement. Or go buy a new painting. Yeah, mm -hmm. little, little things like that make 
a, they really do make a big difference. And it'll, yeah. you'll find that it just helps you breathe because your space, your body, your life starts becoming your own again. And that was exactly what, well, that was part of what I was going to say, not, not the whole thing, but I totally agree with you on the rearranging and everything. And I always suggest to people that they get a project and like, like you said, kind of rearrange everything, or maybe they want to paint the walls and whatever, um, getting rid of the things. I agree with all of that. Um, and the thing that I was actually thinking of that I couldn't remember in that moment was kind of related to that. And it was get yourself a freedom object. Right. And what I mean is, um, what I did after I left my ex was, um, I went to pier one <laughs> and I was really, really poor at the time and I couldn't afford a lot, but I found this $8 candle holder. Um, mm -hmm. and it was like a mosaic candle holder. It was very pretty. It just broke like last year. <laughs> one oh. of the kids broke it finally, mm -hmm. but I had it for years and, um, it was just about that big, you know what I mean? And it was, uh, like blues and silvers and purples with the mosaic tiles it was just beautiful and I just loved it and every time I saw it I thought you know what I'm I'm free now I, I'm not stuck in that you know I'm not being abused anymore I'm not going through this anymore and I just I would I kept it you know on at first on my my tv stand at the house you know what was it those things entertainment centers you know and then when when we moved out away from entertainment centers <laughs> then I put it on my entryway table and you know it just I just loved it and it felt Every time I saw it, it reminded me, it gave me good, warm, fuzzy feelings. So what I suggest to people is they find something like that, that they think is something beautiful, something that every time they see it, it kind of makes them feel a little bit happy, even when they're not feeling super happy, you know, and, and get some, and it doesn't have to be expensive. Like I said, mine was like an $8 candle holder, you know, and I just put little tea lights in it. That was it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just made me happy. So find something that makes you feel a little bit happy because when you see it, it's so pretty or it, it gives you that feeling of warm fuzzies, you know what I mean? And, and use that as your sort of transitional, put it somewhere you can see it all the time, put it somewhere that you, you know, when every time you see it, you feel a little warmth and, and that kind of is a, a little way to, jazz up your <laughs> your recovery a little bit in a fun way I guess mm -hmm. um, I always thought that was helpful so little reminders to remind yourself that this is not a bad thing I guess or or to remind yourself that your new life can be beautiful and yes. everything that that you said with rearranging and if I mean if you're not moving out of the house or, or apartment or whatever then definitely rearrange definitely make it look totally different than that than it did when they lived there because that will be another like you said way to kind of shift your head out of that relationship and one last thing look at it as not a horrible life situation but as an opportunity to redefine who you are and what your life looks like and I think if you if you take the right attitude with that it can actually become kind of fun mm -hmm. and and you can now that you're older and you, you're wiser and you're not, you know, you can really define yourself in a way um, that you do with intention. So who do you admire? Who do you wish you were more like? Who, you know, what qualities about yourself are you not so thrilled about? You know, <laughs> what can you, you know, who do you want to be? And that's that, to me, that's an exciting place to be is to, to be able to, and you can really, anybody can be there anytime. We have this ability to redefine ourselves every day if we want. Right. But I think, choosing intentionally who you want to be and, and what you want to do going forward is incredibly um, empowering, enlightening. Um, it can change your life in really, really good ways. So I try to look at it from that perspective when I can. Um, and again, I, I want to reiterate that I understand that the initial months are very difficult and I'm not pretending they're not. But if you can start to shift your way of thinking from, you know, lack to abundance and again I'm not trying to you know get all woo woo on you but from what I don't have to what I do have from what I'm missing to what I'm grateful for you know that kind of mind shift as you do get through those emotions it makes a huge difference I agree I agree completely focusing on the positive um and not in like a toxic invalidating no. way which I know we're both saying that same thing I just want to make it yeah, clear I'm with you to the community. It's, it's um, seeing our future uh, as like, yeah, this is the next chapter in my life. And I get to make, I get to decide wh who is in it and for how long and what this chapter is going to be full of. And it doesn't need, the, we can shift the focus from like getting over our ex or, you know, healing from abuse, like that heavy, that heaviness to, um, 
making this next chapter in our life the best one yet or um you know really like learning how to actively love myself you know these kinds of things so we're steering into something that's positive instead of running from something that's negative exactly and And, yeah yeah and also you know if this helps anybody watching today (laughs) uh the very best revenge you can get on any narcissist is to live an amazing life without them without even thinking Mm -hmm. about them and there will be a day that you will wake up and you will not think about that person and then that night when you go to bed or the next day you'll go oh my god i didn't think of them all day today you know it will happen and then you'll know (laughs) that it's getting better but it you'll you'll it's not like it just snaps at that moment it gets a little better every day you know give fill up your your life with things that you love and people that you love and before you know it you know this toxic energy will become something you for something that's a thing of the past for you that you don't live with every day and part of what you're doing when you're going through the grieving process is releasing the idea of the person you actually signed up for or thought you were ending up with Um, or even if it's like your parent the idea of who you thought a parent was supposed to be for you or what kind of parent you wish you had, you know, uh, letting go of that image. Because the truth is, if we all sat down and thought about what we were really trying to hold on to when we go away from a narcissist or even when they leave us, we would we would have to admit to ourselves that we were missing something that we really don't want, mm-hmm. at least not, not on, if we're talking literally, you know, we don't literally want a person who constantly makes us feel bad about ourselves or constantly destroys our, yeah. So, yeah. Right. And that kind of ties into the, the next part of our question. I know we need to start moving on to the chat. So maybe we can wrap this up in like the next five minutes or so, but um, the, how do we stop secretly hoping they'll return and be better is, you know, to to really see that, that behavior for what it is. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we start filling up our life with people, places, things, experiences that are nourishing and that we enjoy, the the pull to uh, toxic people or less than nourishing relationships it loses its appeal. Mm. And and so and so in before that happens, we might need to remind ourselves a handful of times. Like one of the things that worked for me was reminding myself when I found myself missing him, it was like, Dana, you don't miss him. You miss the man he pretended to be. That's right. And, you know, see this behavior clearly and hope secretly hoping that they'll return and be better. It change doesn't work that way. It really does. And I think under truly understanding that when dysfunctional behavior is present, it's because functional behavior isn't. So it's not that a person, even if they were to be like, yeah, I'm totally going to change. I'm going to go get into therapy and I'm going to, you know, get a life coach. I'm going to do all these things. Um, They're not going to come back anytime soon and, and be changed or, and that they, they don't even really do that. Most of the time it's, they just promise things will be different, but the, the reality is they completely lack the light, the insight and the level of self-awareness and accountability and all of the like internal tools Mm -hmm. to make those changes happen. Yep. So it's hoping that they'd be better is, is, um, self-destructive. It's self-destructive. And when we can see it as it's, it's, I'm trying to say how to phrase this in a way that doesn't sound kind of so harsh, but um, it's very naive. And I know that that sounds harsh, but I can't think of a better way to put it right now, but idealistic it's, ide- it's the malignant optimism. There you go. You know, yep. um, because it's not reality. And, uh, but, but this is one of those things that gets passed around society as truth. Oh, people can change and, oh, you know, forgive and forget and true love conquers all and all of this. It's that stuff's nonsense. It goes great on greeting cards, right? But this is no way to live your life. You're going to go straight off a cliff. You're so right. So it's important that the only 
sign of changed behavior is changed behavior. It's not empty promises and it's not um, somebody being on their best behavior. Like changed behavior, it takes time over a consistent, you know, uh, consistent events right. to see has this person actually changed. But the thing is, when we love ourselves, when our self-esteem is at a level, when we know how to give ourselves love and how to nourish ourselves and when we're okay with um, being single and we know that we're worth valuing and that we have self-worth as a person and we have healthy standards for our life, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if they've changed or not because the, dam the potential damage to us is, is, too, is too great. And so I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of factors that work. Working on self-esteem is a big one. Reminding ourselves of, of who they actually are versus the relationship we thought we could someday possibly have or who they pretended to be on their best behavior makes a difference. Absolutely. Um, do you have anything on that tab? No, I say let's jump into the chat. I, I'm with you okay. with what you said. Yeah. And I think what I said kind of tied in. Do you have a question for us? Um, I did let me hear first one, Crystal, who says, is there any way to get them to stop provoking? Gray rock only encourages him to be more vindictive and provoking and it never stops. Okay. If, if gray rock is encouraging him to be more provocative with your, with his behavior, then that means it's working. Uh, so keep doing it. Now, if you're being physically abused in any way this does not count this is not the advice you should hear um but if you're if it's just just uh emotional psychological stuff if you hold out on the gray rock they'll eventually break um with that being said you know if you're dealing with them because of a child or or a business or something like that you know all business all the time no emotions at all um it, they gray rock is essentially meant to bore them so that they don't get any supply from you so if you hold on that i mean really i think when you what you know you're more malignant you're more verbally violent narcissists is that a better way to say it mm -hmm. those who are more aggressive um they're going to amp up their game with gray rock and if you don't hold out they'll know that they can do that but if you continue to hold out no matter what they'll break and they'll stop and they'll try something else. A lot of times then they try the love bombing thing or they try, you know, silent treatment or whatever, but it shuts them up <laughs> um, if you hold out. In my experience, Dana, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I guess I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, I guess I'd want to know, is this person, a, who is this person and do you right. have to see them? <laughs> yeah. um, if you don't have to see them, then I would just cut contact. Yeah. Uh, and then I would also want to know, how are you doing Gray Rock? Because uh, Valid. Gray Rock, like Angie is saying, it's all about uh, being boring. And, and a, another part of that is because they get so threatened by any, any six, anything that somebody else has that they don't. Right. They perceive as a threat. And so that's another part of Gray Rock. So it's, it's, Base, it's keep it. It's basically sharing the the details of your life as you would share them with a complete stranger in an elevator. So it's base. It's so not at all. It's it's brief, pleasant, polite conversation. That's just surface level. It's about the weather. It's about you know, and you're you're basically smiling and nodding. The whole goal with Gray Rock is just to not rock the boat because there's no point. Right. And so if they are, and here's the thing with provoking is provoking. Yes, I get it. I totally get it. That is a struggle and a half to get to the point where we can be unreactive to that. But just realize this is not, you're, you're dealing with somebody who has some serious limitations mm -hmm. with their behavior and in immaturity with their behavior and in everything. So, you know, trying to set boundaries, trying to have a give and take conversation, trying to, you know, be solutions oriented, all of that does not apply when you're right. dealing with a, a power, like a, a domination driven type person. So um, it takes 
two people to argue. So realizing if their goal, and I, and I get it, I get it. I've had a handful of people like this in my life over the years where you, you're like, man, I feel like you're trying to start a fight. Mm-hmm. No. Um, and they are. And they <laughs> a are, lot of times. Right, right. And <laughs> yeah. they are. The best way to diffuse that is to just start agreeing with everything they say. Yeah. Or um, excuse yourself. Or you can just say something like, well, that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. That's or I'm not favorites. sure what I think about that. Mm-hmm. You're not feeding into it. Yeah. So, um, or you're flipping the conversation back on, on them. You know, if, if, God, I had a coworker who would do that stuff all the time. It used to drive me nuts because I didn't realize that that's what was going on Mm -hmm. until one day I'm like, oh my God, um, (laughs) this is all intentional. And, uh, oh yeah, then it was a game changer. But if you realize you're kind of walking into a trap, Mm -hmm. right. Um, to put it back on them. Like if they're asking your opinion because they want to argue with your opinion and you can kind of see that train coming, put it back on them. Mm -hmm. But they say, oh, I don't know. I'm thinking about, um, you know, selling my house. And they're waiting for you to give your opinion about that so they can argue with it. Then you'd say, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, I I hope hope you find uh, another home that, you know, you're really looking forward to Mm -hmm. or whatever. Like you're not, there is nothing other than uh, kind of lukewarm <laughs> surface level conversation with them, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. And yeah. then it kind of, once, once you emotionally detach from it, it almost becomes amusing because it's, oh, it does. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like it's so ridiculous and, and it's kind of, it's just kind of fun. It feels uh, like with this coworker I was talking about, I, I felt a lot like Mario in the super Mario games where like, like, like the little turtles, like all of these little different things are coming down to Mario. Mm-hmm. Like the little turtles are coming and then like the, um, you know, all, all of the different threats and you're just jumping over them and, and yeah. squashing them and kicking them out of the way. And it's really just, good when you get the fireballs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Love it. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. I think that's all true. Um, and, and that is important. You're right. And I didn't even think of how, how are you doing gray rock, but that's the truth. And it's not about one thing. I know a lot of people think, you know, it means try not to talk to them or try not, but you don't, you know, you, you use gray rock in exactly as you described where it, it's just about not making waves and keep and make, boring them <laughs> essentially. Right. Um, Cause a yeah. lot of people, when they do gray rock, what they're doing. And here's another tip too, is to make sure that your body language is matching up with your verbal language. Yes. Because a lot of people will be like, oh yeah, I'm totally doing gray rock. And then I come to find out, oh no, they're actually, their body language, you know, they're, they're, you can tell they're, uh, they're visibly upset by this other person's presence, or they're sitting on the other side of the room or all of their body language says, this person's really getting to me. Yeah. Or if you're anything like me, it's all readable in your face. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like you can, you know, you make a, yeah. you, know, you don't even realize. <laughs> right. Know. Right. Give yourself like a, a little um, practice doing a poker face. I, I used to practice in the mirror. I would practice and feel how it felt so that I knew in the moment how to hold my face, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> practice. Right. And, yeah. And don't, don't necessarily, I mean, you can have a, a mildly pleasant look on your face but try not to smile too big because they they like it creeps them out and then they freak out on you (laughs) Mm -hmm. unless you want to creep them out I mean by all means yeah (laughs) anyway yeah the goal here is to to basically it's completely unbothered yes is is the goal that you're going for and it's and because you have healthier boundaries now you're realizing the conversation pleasant polite Mm -hmm. brief doesn't need to be snippy. Doesn't need to be rude. Mm-hmm. So like, like you would have with a, a neutral stranger in an elevator. That's yes. It. Or even yeah. better, something that I always, that I always thought of, if you've ever worked in customer service and you've had any sort of customer service and you've had a mean, angry client or customer coming at you, at, at, I would, you know, when they're, if they're very, like if the narcissist is very angry or pushy or whatever, almost like you would talk to them. Like, sir, mm-hmm. I totally, and that's not calling them sir or ma'am, but, you know, for example, like, you know, you would talk to a customer, uh, you know, I totally understand your experience. You would, you know, 
totally understand what you're talking about. So sorry that it happened. Won't happen again. <laughs> I've seen that work as well, not necessarily as a gray rock, but as a calm them down kind of thing. So yeah. the customer service voice, <laughs> you know, uh, just real quick, as an aside, I used to work customer service many moons ago too. Yeah. And um, one of the things that, that really helped me to detach emotionally was that something by accident, but we, I worked for this company and they would have secret shoppers uh -huh. and they would also have secret shoppers um, cause a scene and they would see how we would handle it. Interesting. How do you handle an irate customer? How do you handle a return? How do you handle somebody who's like um, stolen something or, you know, made a mess in the aisle or is drunk or, or what have you. And so we never knew who was actually a real customer gone wild or if it was an act like an actor wow. and, and it was so great because um and then if we we handled it appropriately we'd get some sort of reward and so it was great it was like then i just emotionally detached completely yeah um and it was kind of fun because then we'd go above and beyond to try to over like really handle that situation mm -hmm. you know awesome and right. Uh, it, yeah, it was a total win-win. So I guess kind of thinking of it that way, if somebody, if, if you were being filmed on this, um, you know, I guess pretend like somebody else is watching sometimes can help. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's how I got through um, newborns as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's another story, but I literally <laughs> did. I, I, when I was up in the middle of the night with them, I would feel so crazy. And so I would, I would want to talk to them nicely, but I'd be feeling mean things because <laughs> I was tired. Mm -hmm. And, and I would imagine that there was someone standing outside my window listening to me talk to the baby. So I'd always talk to the baby nice. It, and I know that sounds so stupid, but like, we all have that part of ourselves that's kind of mean, don't we? Or is it just me <laughs> when it's tired? <laughs> it's oh, totally. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say that. I, just real quick. Too, I read this book and I never, I hardly ever read fiction. I'm a big nonfiction reader. I came across this fiction book a couple years ago. I don't even remember how or why or what it was even called, but the, it was like a young adult type book. And it was about these high schoolers and this one girl could listen to other people's thoughts. And so she, anyway, she ends up solving a crime because of it. But awesome. I remember it causing me anxiety, the thought of, oh my gosh, what are my thoughts? Like, what would people hear? Ooh. And the, the unintended benefit of that book was just like you're saying, it made me hyper aware of like what I was thinking yeah. and about other people and myself. And it really radically changed the thoughts I had to things that were more positive and uplifting. And it was weird. That's but, yeah. interesting. I like that. That perspective. I like the idea too with the newborn of, uh, yeah. you know, what would somebody else say? If, yeah. yeah. It helped me a lot. It really did. I know it sounds um, like I'm a horrible person. No, nope. that makes <laughs> but, complete, complete sense. Yeah. If you ever, you know, if you've ever been sleep deprived for weeks at a time, <laughs> then you know. And then this little tiny person who you love more than your own life has this insistence on not understanding when it's time to sleep. Mm -hmm. ah! Just pretend someone else is outside your window listening. It helps. Yep. <laughs> Random yep. bit of advice. But yeah, I, I really like the idea of that because it does. And I think if you think about it, and it never occurred to me to apply this to this, but if you think about it from that perspective of you know, what if somebody else could hear what I was thinking or saying to myself, that is a really good point that you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Here's yeah. another question um, okay. from Glow and Heal who says, how do you handle being more traumatized by narcissists that hide in narcissist abuse forms and trigger victims on purpose? Hmm. That's difficult. I know that depending on, you know, I know my group, I know Dana's group, I, I assume I'm pretty sure has, we have good uh, mod admins and moderators. And so they tend to be on top of that stuff and, and grab those people out of there as quickly as they're found. I mean, we can't always catch them before they get in, but we try. Um, with that being said, I think, you know, number one, if somebody begins to trigger you in a forum or in a Facebook group or whatever, you know, definitely report the comment because probably they're triggering other people too. Um, but outside of that, you know, recognize these are just people on the internet and some people are, you know, 
just out to hurt other people. You know, they might be trolls or they might be somebody who's mad because something Dana said or something I said or something someone else said made their person leave them, you know, <laughs> and so they might want to take revenge on other people like their person. Um, I think it's a matter of perspective. Um, certainly you can become triggered and I cannot sit here and tell you that I've never been upset by anyone on the internet because I sure as heck have. Um, but, and sometimes people will say things that are intentionally cutting and horrible and they will pull things out about you as a person or, um, you know, based on your appearance or based on, you know, they'll go scour your page and try to find something that they think will really trigger you. Um, and there are, I, I actually know a person in real life who lives to troll people on the internet. I mean, and he just laughs about it. He thinks it's the funniest thing in the whole wide world. And I don't think people think about how they really truly affect the people they're affecting. So I think one of the most important things is to give yourself a little distance and recognize that that person doesn't know you in real life. And that if you walked up to them in a grocery store, they would never say that stuff to you. You know what I mean? And just use those those features, the reporting button, you know, report that comment to the, you know, I don't know which forums you're talking about. I'm assuming that you're talking about like one that I run or one like Dana runs. Um, and we are on top of it. Our admins are on top of the, the reported comments and, you know, you can always tag it an admin as well in the groups. Um, but ultimately perspective on who that person actually is and why they would be doing that, I think is also important to maintain and recognize that if it is a narcissist from your own life you can you know block each block each account of theirs and even report duplicate accounts i believe if we're talking about facebook anyway dana thoughts yeah um i agree definitely reporting that kind of behavior um you can all, a lot of forms you can block people mm -hmm. that too but, but i think it also helps to to have uh, appropriate expectations. And sometimes this is a thing that you, you just have to go through. Um, I know when I first joined support groups, even like with, I guess everything, right? Like everything in life, what we think something is and what something actually is are two very different things mm -hmm. in every way across life. So I remember when I first started joined support groups, I was totally shocked by some of the, the horrific things that people would say, or that exes would come in there, or I, I, it just never crossed my mind in a million years that this kind of stuff would happen. Mm -hmm. And then once I realized, I, I kind of got comfortable, I'd spent enough time in there to realize how this group, how these groups actually work, how the internet actually works when it comes to support groups. Then it stopped throwing me so off balance because I just knew like, this is a thing. Right. And so, um, you know, to, to just not get that rattled by it. But yeah, at first, same thing with like starting a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I had no idea the kind of stuff people would say. And the first six months or so, a year of my channel, some of the, the comments, you know, they can be, they can cut deep. And especially when you're being vulnerable about your own life and lessons yep. learned and things like that. And there were, there were many days where I would read something that was really hurtful and it felt like it would just kick the chair out from underneath me. And I yeah. would get so angry and just so, just crying, angry, just rage filled. Mm -hmm. And it would take a good like 36 hours or so to shake it off. Yeah. Nowadays, it's like 36 seconds. If Same. even that, yeah. you know, you just, whatever, drive on. Delete. <laughs> yeah. Hide. So realizing the dynamics yeah. of the internet and there's just, there's just jerk face people out there big time. Yeah. And they literally, I think a lot of them, if you knew what their life really looked like, you would, you would probably laugh or feel sorry for them. One of the two, um, because people who have the time to do crap like that are not people who have great lives, if we're being honest. Yeah. So something nice. to think about. <laughs> do you have a question? Um, I have one from Bonnie. Okay. She says, question, why do toxic narcissists have to paint you as crazy to everyone when they have a falling out with you, as in smear campaign, when you are finally distanced from their toxic grip? So I will just really quickly, you know, same thing happened to me. And what it comes down to is that the toxic person, and I, and I know in this case, I think Bonnie's talking about a toxic parent. In my case, it was also a toxic parent that did this to me. I mean, they all do it, but in varying iterations, because 
you know, anyway, but this happened within my own family. Um, the smear campaign is still probably going on, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> and it's just because they can't handle the idea that you would leave them because of them. And so they have to assume that, uh, you know, they have to convince themselves and everyone around them <laughs> that you're the bad one. And so you must be crazy if you don't want to be with their amazingness, right? So they then twist everything you've said, everything you've done, and turn it into them being the victim. And I think this is about, you know, they tell a sob story, they get more supply. You know, they get people to feel sorry for them. Oh, it's terrible that you have such a bad situation or a bad child or daughter or son or wife or husband or whatever. Poor you. I feel so sorry for you. And then they, you know, they get lots of attention for that. So I think that's about them being in denial and needing people to be on their side and so they create a victim role for themselves and, and it, you know inevitably throwing you under the bus and making you the bad guy when really you're the one sitting there probably alone and they're the ones with all the monkeys around them <laughs> the flying mm -hmm. monkeys as it were so yeah dana thoughts yeah um i think deeply dysfunctional people tend to fall into at a minimum, two different categories. There's the ones that are, uh, like Angie's talking about, that are not aware mm -hmm. of their behavior. And then also what you were also kind of talking about, the ones that are aware of their behavior. So right. um, like, again, to draw on my own experience, um, my Jack in particular, I found out he had lied about things and had painted a smear campaign but it wasn't even like close to based in the truth i mean right. he was telling people that i was cheating on him that um I, god only knows what else it was complete like not this wasn't like a difference of perspective right like this was complete he'd m completely fabricated uh every just what he was telling people to, to get sympathy all that on the other hand so you have like these intentional pathological liars um but then the ones that are not self-aware like angie was saying it's really this idea you're talking about a whole different mindset yeah so from their perspective it's um they don't they have no self-awareness so they're like well it's obviously not me and my behavior right so therefore by, by default it has to be you right but what you're taught what the issue is their boundaries, their expectations, their mindset, their worldview is deeply skewed. So in their, according to their map of how the world should be and how people should interact, they are the victim yeah. because, but it's because their roadmap is faulty. Yep. Right. So the rest of us have this idea of uh, kind of how to work as a team and like what is fair and appropriate behavior. And, but for them, if, if they don't get their way, then they feel victimized. And if other people, it's very immature. If other people don't continually focus on all of the good and um, let them off the hook for the bad, then they feel victimized. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. So. And I, and I think that you're right. And I think there are those who do intentionally, like you said, those, I want to call them on the higher end of the spectrum, but, um, but I think there's also a spectrum of that, like of, the level to which they will intentionally manipulate and i think it's mm -hmm. it's based partially on intelligence uh, but mostly on self-awareness and and i honestly i think those who are i mean they're all toxic and they can all be equally toxic but i yeah. think if someone is is intentionally strategizing uh then you're looking at somebody more along the lines of a sociopath or a psychopath oh 100 percent. yeah yeah for yeah. sure yep I don't. Um, um, do you want to do one more question and then sure. call it? Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have one? I have one, but I, it's kind of vague. Okay. So. Let's see. Um, I'm looking. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll bring up this question and okay. we'll see if she adds to it. Um, Channel okay. Tools says, how do you stop gaslighting yourself? Because that's what I do, I feel, as a result oh, yeah. of his gaslighting. Yeah, you kind of talked about that a little bit earlier in this uh, session, um, and I and I see that I, I guess I've even done it to myself, um, and I think there are a lot of 
things you can do. But I mean, one thing just in particular is what I call intentional thought management, uh, where you kind of keep your eye on what you're thinking. I like to have people start off with two weeks at least, uh, sometimes a month to, to kind of practice this. Um, and that is, you know, each thing, you know, monitor your thoughts on, on purpose. And if you catch yourself, um, you know, tearing yourself down or you catch yourself creating doubt in your mind about your experiences or, or whatever, then remind yourself. Um, I think journaling is very helpful for that. I love the bullet journal for that purpose to kind of keep things straight as to what have what has actually happened. Um, but also I think it's about, uh, you know, again, just like everything that we've kind of discussed here, pattern interrupt if you catch yourself doing it, uh, you know, positive, af positive affirmations, um, keeping your mind in the place that, you know, eye on the prize kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then just proving yourself right as often as possible. And I, I mean, against the gaslighting or proving the gaslighting wrong, whatever, uh, do it anyway, you know, and, and show yourself that you can. And then, and then one last thing, if, if it does happen to be that what is happening in your head is that this is the voice of a narcissist in your life that you are no longer around or you're still around. Imagine, you know, this is a visual you can use. Crawl a little version of yourself, crawls up the little ladder coming up the back of your neck mm -hmm. and goes inside your head and finds the voice, which ironically looks just like your toxic mother or ex or whatever. And then you imagine they're in a wheelchair and you just push them right out of your head and out your nose <laughs> and then it's a, it's it kind of makes you laugh a little bit you know yeah, and, yeah. you know and then it distracts your thoughts enough that you can then put something better in place and of course blow your nose at the end if you really feel like pushing them out so <laughs> kind of makes it funny anyway like that. yeah <laughs> yeah uh i guess i would say i would be curious to know kind of what are you gaslighting yourself about um because if you don't know and i think angie's approach is is awesome if if you are aware of like these thoughts I'm having are not real kind of thing like, like that's a great way to handle that if like the, the one of the first questions we were talking about um right about how do you feel safe again a lot of people feel like they're gaslighting themselves when in reality they're kind of learning how to have healthier boundaries or they're at least questioning them so they're like, what's wrong with me? I don't feel safe. What's wrong with me? I have trouble trusting. And to go back and examine like, well, are these feelings legitimate? Like, do you have trouble trusting because this coworker or your partner or your friend is untrustworthy or you've had issues with them in the past? Like, if so, then uh, you're not gaslighting yourself. You're starting to see problematic behavior clearly. Uh, if, if, you're, if you feel unsafe, because you've got somebody that's continuing to harass you or um, they have fr your friends of theirs are continuing to harass you, that's understandable as to why you would feel unsafe. So it's important to examine uh, what, why are you feeling the way you're feeling? I would say the vast majority of the time, nine times out of 10, if not even more than that, there's how we feel is there's valid reasons for it. And we tend to make things worse and therapy for sure can make things worse when we, we just assume that, oh, everything is due to our past and there's no connection to the present moment. And so we're just trying to force ourselves to get over it, which just makes us neurotic and creates anxiety and depression. So start there. Like, are, is there, are these feelings based in reality? And if so, where is this coming from and how, can you address the issue um, at the root? You know, like if you have a nail in your foot, it's appropriate for your foot to hurt. But the solution isn't to, to meditate, to get rid of the pain. It's to get the nail out first, right? It's kind of the same thing with emotional Absolutely. pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, we are over and Angie, you have just been such an angel. I know you have a headache and okay. <laughs> uh, you are my hero for, for pushing through on a live stream. I uh, just, we appreciate that and um, my goodness. So uh, yes, you guys, we, this is a live stream we do every Tuesday or we try to do at least every Tuesday. We alternate channels. Uh, so next week we'll be over on Angie's YouTube channel, which is Angie Atkinson. And uh, 
so 1 30 p.m ish eastern standard time we normally go for about an hour and so make sure that you're subscribed to both of our channels if this is something that you're interested in getting notified about okay angie have a wonderful rest of your day thanks Tana. you too see you soon okay. see you soon <laughs> bye bye <laughs>